Let's all stand and praise our Lord and Savior. together this morning. We're uh, glad to be able to get together and worship. Uh, several things I want to share with you tonight, uh, or today. Tonight in this room we'll have our congregational business meeting. It's our once a year congregational business meeting. We'll look at uh, electing officers um, and passing the budget for next year and the reports will be given and so forth. So six o'clock if you're a member of the church, come on out. Uh, we need 26 of you here to make a quorum. So you know, that'd be great. Um, there's no signing bonus and that either. Okay, I got a text yesterday asking me, are we going to have a Christmas challenge this year? So for those of you who don't remember or aren't aware, the Christmas challenge goes like this. We've encouraged folks to add up what they're spending on Christmas, how much uh, the money they're spending on Christmas, and then give the same amount to the church, and then we give it to an organization that we've pre-designated. And so uh, we've done that over uh, the course of nine years. We've done it eight out of the last nine years. Uh, you have given uh, just uh, over and above what we 
use for the budget, you've given $141,000 over those uh, eight out of nine years. So yeah, it's just been uh, tremendous and it's just a great opportunity to bless some organizations. So this year, we the answer to the question from the text is yes, we are. And today I was going to announce the uh, folks who are going to receive it. Uh, we're going to be doing the Christmas challenge on behalf of an organization. It's actually a church plant called Really Recovered. Uh, the church plant is a Christian Missionary Alliance church plant. So you might say to yourself, wait, you're a Brethren Church, why are you doing a Christian Missionary Alliance church plant? Well, my first answer would be because planting churches that reach people for Christ is kingdom work, and we should be, first of all, involved in kingdom work, not necessarily denominationally labeled work, but that would be my first answer. My second answer would be uh, they are reaching a group of people that we as a church probably are not very well equipped to reach directly. So this is an organization, a church plant, that is started already. It's already meeting. They've purchased some property, and they, are ha they have two houses on the property. One is for men, one is for women, and they're called sober living houses. They're taking folks out of the prison system and out of our jail system locally and uh, in Ohio, and they are helping them come to faith and leave their life of addiction behind. Now, so what they're doing is tremendous ministry. Um, the folks who are part of it, the, the man who's leading it, his name is Ken Hawkins. Ken was with our official board a few months ago. He spoke, I think, for half an hour. I do not think he took a breath um, during that entire half an hour. Um, and I don't think we did either, because we listened to how God met him, how God changed him, and how God is using him to reach folks. And they're seeing significant life change in people. And by the way, it's also messy and fraught with troubles, right? So here's the other good news for you about the Christmas challenge. Next Sunday, Ken will be here, and you can hear him directly and hear from him uh, what God is doing and all that is going on. All right, so that's exciting. The other thing that's coming up, uh, well, Rex is going to share about Operation Christmas Child, but before he does that, right behind Rex's head and on this side of the, uh, the hall here, we have boxes. Those boxes can contain non-perishable food. came from the school system here in town in Smithville. Uh, kids brought all this stuff in. We're going to feed 14 families at Thanksgiving, another 17 at Christmas. There's an entire another week of food um, that's being collected in the school system, which gonna, it's going to end up here probably around Christmas time. But um, this is, again, the food distribution we do. So in the bulletin, you'll see we need help getting that stuff organized and help, help making the distribution happen. The dates and times are in here. Uh, please sign up if you're available to help us make that happen this year. I'm going to invite Rex McConaughey up to share about Operation Christmas Child, and then I'm going to come back up. Well, as you can see, in front of us here is a whole stack of shoe boxes that you have brought in. And I just praise the Lord for your response to this ministry. We have shoe boxes here. We've got them in front of the sanctuary over there. I think we've still got like, uh, some shoe boxes downstairs. So uh, uh, thank you again for your support of this ministry. Each of these shoe boxes represents an opportunity for a child to learn about Jesus Christ and to affect that child's eternal destiny. Uh, it's just amazing what God has done through the shoebox ministry. It's uh, you know, affected not only the child that receives these shoe boxes, but those, their family and their community has also been usually affected by what takes place here. You have been praying for these as you have packed the shoebox. You've asked God, God, what should I put in the shoebox? I don't know the child that's going to receive this shoebox. And we still don't know what child is going to receive these shoe boxes. But God knows. And it's just amazing the way he has prepared uh, children to receive these shoe boxes and prepared the way for these shoe boxes. This is just the start of these journey, these shoe boxes. Uh, from here, next week, we have we are the drop-off location. People are bringing shoe boxes in here. We put in cartons. Uh, if you have signed up to do that, uh, Appreciate your help and willingness to help during uh, to do that. Uh, if you have signed up to do that, please be here about 15 minutes before the time, so we have a time of opportunity to pray and uh, to share with you what we're doing. We're going to have to do some some things a little differently this year because of the COVID-19, but uh, we're still doing it, and uh, we're still hoping that God will bless and will. Uh, 
take these shoe boxes and, and expedite their journey from here to the children that will receive them. Let's pray. Father, we've prayed over these shoe boxes already. We've prayed what to put in them. And once again, we come before you asking, Lord, that children that receive these, we don't know who they are when we never meet them, but we know you do. And you've prepared hearts for these shoe boxes. Lord, we think of Jesus and during his earthly ministry, how he took five loaves and two fishes and fed a multitude of people. We pray that for these shoe boxes, that the ministry of these shoe boxes will spread beyond the child their family, and to the community. Lord, that these children might come to know you as a result of the shoe boxes that we have packed and the shoe boxes that are here before us. Lord, you've done amazing things through this, and we expect great things from these shoe boxes as well. And we give you the praise and the honor and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a couple other things I want to highlight or, or mention today. Um, those of you know Barb Chapin, Barb's son Michael is uh, has been tested positive for COVID-19, and that's of particular concern given his underlying health issues. So if you want to be in prayer for Michael, that would be great. I know it's hard for Barb as she's sort of trying to parent from a distance. She can't be with him. So uh, if you think about them, please be in prayer. Also, we need to extend the sympathy of our church to three families. Um, the first, Walter and Eileen Vincent on the death of Eileen's a sister-in-law, Kim Piles, the sympathy of the church also to Norman Linda Ream on the death of Linda's father, um, and then also uh, Alan and Linda McFalls on Linda's mother. Uh, her mother died uh, this past week, uh, so we want to be in prayer for these families. Father, we do uh, lift up these families to you. They're struggling. It's time of grief and difficulty. Uh, we know of uh, two of these folks. They lived long lives into their 90s. And yet the reality is we are never ready to let folks go. We're never ready for our mom or our dad to, to not be just a phone call away or being able to visit them. And so we ask that you would comfort these families and as well watch over uh, Michael and bring healing to his body in these days. As we worship you today, may our spirits be lifted by yours. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
Thank you for another day that we are able to come and worship you. We are your children. We thank you. We are who you say we are. You turn us into your armies to serve you and to worship you. And Lord, you are a wonderful God. In your son's name we pray. Amen. It is harvest time. You know how I know that? Because when I drive into the office through the week, I get behind wagons. 
wagons and wagons and wagons of corn. And uh, the wagon I followed in last week, there were two hooked to a John Deere tractor, and they were scooching along the road back and forth. It was making me very nervous. I actually helped shovel grain back into a container that had fallen out, come out of a wagon that had gone onto its side not far from where I was uh, a number of years back. And so I, I kind of slowed down, I put on my hazard lights, and I followed them and thought, well, if it goes over, at least I'll be here to help. Um, but that's harvest time. Uh, harvest time is the exciting part of the cycle of farming where you get to reap what you sow. Right? You planted things in the ground, they grew, they matured, and now it's time to bring them into the barns or take them out to the grain elevator or wherever we're taking them. Uh, what's exciting is in the spring you plant, and for a long time or a period of time after you plant, you don't know what's going on. You, you know because you know what goes on under the ground, but you don't see it. And people like me who don't grow anything, uh, we drive by the field that's been planted and nothing's going on and nothing's going on. And then all of a sudden it's like magic, like boom, now these little plants pop out of the ground and it's super cool to watch. And we know that by 4th of July, how high is your corn supposed to be? I'm not sure that's actually true or, or really helps, but it is something to say around the 3rd of July. Like, I don't know if it's going to make it. Not this high yet. But it's harvest time. Harvesting is when the things that you've planted now have grown. They've grown under the soil. They've come out of the soil. They've emerged. Now they've grown and developed to be full-grown plants, and it's exciting. I want us to, uh, to think about that in reference to two categories of sin. Now, a couple of weeks we've been talking about grieving. Now we're going to talk about sin. So you're probably thinking, was he just in a bad mood? But these are just things we need to discuss. And so two categories of sin I want to give you today, and that is uh, external and internal sin. External and internal sin. And so these two categories of sin, and I've just sort of made them up, um, the external sin is this. It's the sin in our lives that is observable. You beat someone up. Someone could videotape that. There could be a YouTube video showing you doing it. You drive your car into someone else's car and drive away. You plow over their mailbox. You, uh, uh, you, you steal something that doesn't belong to you. These are recordable, observable, outside. People could see them. Uh, of course, all sin God sees, internal or external. But the external ones are the ones all of us can see. And we'll even include in that not just what we see with our eyes, but what we hear. So we'll include our words, and our words included with that are our attitudes that come out with our words, right? You know how, how much you reveal with your tone of voice and, and all of that kind of stuff. All that's observable. We can see it. Internal sins are the ones no one can directly see. It is like that seed underground, that seed that is growing and developing, and you might be nurturing it, you might be helping it to grow along, and no one else knows it's there except God. You and God are the only ones who know because it hasn't emerged. It hasn't popped through the surface yet. It hasn't become an external thing. It's just underground and there and growing and developing. Last week, I showed you a picture of my camper. We looked at it. And we said, look, here's the outside of the camper. It looks really good from the outside. But then I showed you a picture of the roof section peeled off. And those of you who saw it, you could see the, the black mold that was growing between the roof and the ceiling in that space where there's just supposed to be insulation, not standing water like I found when I opened mine up. Well, that stuff's happening inside and, and without the discerning eye, you wouldn't know it's there. It's just going on and going on and going on. And eventually, it's going to show up. That's internal. It's happening on the inside. And when we make a list of sins, we often make a list that is exclusively external in nature. Uh, many years ago, I was being interviewed for a youth director job at a church, and uh, the pastor sat me down, and it was at a McDonald's, so there you go. And he said to me, don't smoke, don't drink, don't chew, and don't date women who do, do you? That was his interview, one of his interview questions. And I was, uh, well, I laughed. And I took the chew out, and I put my drink down. No, I, I, I just, I was like, wait a minute. Okay, so this is external, right? That's what we look around. We say, wow, well, I can't believe they did that. And it's something you saw, right? I can't believe they said that. Something they said. Or you look on their Facebook page, and you're like, I can't believe they wrote that. All of that, that's all external. We want to think about what's inside. We want to think about the internal. And so my next point is this. The Ten Commandments, which has got to be the best, longest, greatest list God gives us about sin, includes most, both external and internal sins, as the categories I've laid out, right? 
You shall not murder. Is that observable? Is that recordable? Is that happening on the outside? Yeah, all that. Right? And God gives this list of the, uh, of the Ten Commandments to the people who have come out of slavery in Egypt. And he says to them, essentially, I'm your God. This is how you should live freely. I'm your God. Follow these and you will be free. So he says, don't murder. I value human life. Don't murder. Right? You shall not commit adultery. How many marriages, sacred bonds have been broken because of adultery? It's recoverable. Marriages can be put back together, but it's a very difficult process to go through. Don't break the bond of marriage. Make your commitment to your spouse and keep your commitment to your spouse. Do not go looking somewhere else. In the list, he says, you shall not steal. But you go to a store these days, you see a bunch of things. You see uh, signs about masks. Often you'll see people standing at the front door, uh, either encouraging or enforcing, depending on your position on the issue, uh, the, the fact that you have to wear a mask. When you walk in, you see all the products, you see all the employees, whatever. But if you look up, what do you see? Lights and camera, right? Security cameras have been part of retail businesses for decades. And for my lifetime, they've gotten cooler and cooler and cooler and smaller and smaller and smaller and more prevalent. They're everywhere, right? They're over the general sales floor of most retailers. They're watching. They're recording. There are people in rooms watching the live feeds, and there are people who then watch the recordings if anything comes up missing. Those recordings are not just of, a, of, a, of us as customers, but many of them are lodged right over the top of every cash register. Why? Because employees will steal. Stealing is observable. It's external. It's something that can be seen and recorded and reported. And so the Ten Commandments includes these on the list of things we should not do. But there are more. And the example I want to give you from the Ten Commandments of an internal sin, and we're going to spend more time on it, is you shall not covet. And this one gets a little more explanation, right? You get, don't steal, don't murder, don't commit adultery. No real explanations, no more words to describe it. But here it says, you shall not covet, first off, your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. Coveting is taking place when we see what other people have, we compare it to what we have, and we desire it strongly, and it begins to move us to stew over and to consider and think about how bad we really want it. I see it, I want it, and then I spend a lot of time thinking about it. God tells you, don't covet your neighbor's house. Now, we jump to the New Testament and discuss what Jesus says about a neighbor, but think just in the context of the Old Testament for just a moment. A neighbor in the ancient world, in, in, in ancient Israel, the people around you, right? Right? The ancient people were not nearly as mobile as we are. They couldn't jump in their car and drive 300 miles. You go 300 miles in the ancient world, you're walking, you're riding a donkey, something. But you're not getting in a car with heated leather seats, uh, with a radio that you can listen to whatever music you want to, and a DVD player to entertain your kids. Travel is much more limited, much more difficult. And so your neighbors are really the people around you. But if we think about applying it to us, our neighborhoods are way bigger we can see all kinds of things about people. We can see all kinds of things about people who live close by to us, who live hundreds, thousands, miles away. Through media and social media, we can see all kinds of things. And so God says, don't covet your neighbor's house. Let's just talk about this list for a moment. Don't covet your neighbor's house. Uh, you probably had this experience. You've either been in or been around someone's house, and you think to yourself, man, I wish I had that kitchen. By the way, I've never had that thought, but I wish I had that kitchen, right? Never once struck me like, cool kitchen. I'm like, ah, whatever. But you might look at their house and say, oh, there's a beautiful setting. Well, look at all this woods. Look at all this ground. Well, it's facing the right direction, so I'm sitting in my chair in this living room and I can watch the sunrise. That would not be me. The sunset, that's more my deal. Uh, whatever it is, it's your whatever. I, you drive by a house, you say, that's an amazing two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve car garage, if that's your thing. 
It's just more my thing. Uh, you, you might look at it and say, oh, those are really cool. You might appreciate it. When we begin to covet, it's when we begin to stew on it and think about it and compare, oh, that's way nicer than mine and way cooler than mine or way bigger than mine or way newer than mine or way more sophisticated or way better setting or whatever it is. Don't covet your neighbor's house, God says, because you should not live with a serious sense of dissatisfaction in your soul all of the time. It is dangerous. It literally is dangerous. Don't covet your neighbor's house. Then it says, don't covet your neighbor's wife. Don't covet your neighbor's wife. Countless marriages have been hurt or destroyed because people violated this commandment. In their minds, in the privacy of their minds, they've compared their wife with someone else's wife or some other person, and they've concluded that their other person's wife or the other person would be a better fit for them or is a better wife than them or a better person than them, and they begin to desire them and want them, and it all happens in the privacy of their minds. I remember a pastor years ago when I first came to faith, he was speaking and he said, I am so glad that my thoughts are not broadcast up on a video screen wall. And it got me thinking, right? What's going on in the privacy of our thoughts? Don't covet your neighbor's house. Don't covet your neighbor's wife. And then we get to the one where we all breathe a sigh of relief, right? It says, don't covet your neighbor's manservant or maidservant. We think, whoo, we don't know anybody who has these, right? Right? We don't know anybody. What was the last time you went to someone's house and you left and you thought to yourself, I really wish I had a servant like that, right? I really wish the person who, uh, you know, Washed my feet when they came in. Were at, you know they were as good as the person. They were better than the person at my house. No, we don't have servants. I, I toured a house with my brother-in-law years ago. It was one he built, and maybe it was twenty years ago. And he was taking me around to the various rooms. And you know, this is the living room. This is the great room. This is the kitchen. This is the this or whatever. It's a three-story house. We get up to the third story, and he says to me, "This is the servants' quarters." I said, well, "What are you talking about?" This isn't Downton Abbey. Come on, what are you talking about, right? He goes, yeah, no, they live up here. This is So this is a living room, and this is the uh, little uh, kitchenette. Here's the bathroom, private bathroom, and here's the furnace and air conditioner system that is just for this space. This is where their domestic help is going to live, and the family's going to live on floors two and one. Now, you showed up at their house, and you saw all that. You might say, ooh, I am coveting their maidservant or manservant. Right? We also might want to skip over ox and donkey because, um, first of all, I don't know anyone who would covet a donkey. Right? That's the first thing that strikes me. But there are people, I guess, who love donkeys and God love them, but the donkey and the ox. What is an ox? An ox in the ancient world is a, is a machine. It's a thing that is used for work. It is not like a pet. It is something that the family would own in order to do work and so if you think about not coveting your neighbor's ox, then you can apply anything that your neighbor uses to work, and you'd be in the right no, in the right category, right? So don't covet your neighbor's backhoe or tractor or iPod or iPad or iPhone or I anything, right? And then when you get to the donkey, the donkey was a, a mode of transportation. Anyone ever covet what somebody else is dri driving these days? Right? Mustangs, yes. Yes, bless you. That's correct. I remember being in high school, and uh, I drove in high school. In, I was in high school in 1988. I graduated, so you can do the math. Um, so in 1988, I drove a 1963 Volkswagen Bug. It was, I believe, five different colors. No one... I, see, what I was trying to do, I was just trying to help my friends. I just didn't want them to covet what I had. So, you know, that's what I drove, right? Right, same year, a guy in my high school drove a brand new Grand Cherokee Jeep Grand Cherokee. Jeep Grand Cherokee. I can't even say it. Right, right. People looked at it. Thought, Man, that's super cool. It had a car phone, not a cell phone, a car phone. Yes. Ask someone older than you what that means if you don't know what I'm talking about. Right. We can spend our days looking at what other people have desire it and let it take residence in our minds and occupy our hearts and our minds. And God says, don't do it. You live in slavery when you do that. I've taken you out of slavery. I want you to live like free people. Free people are not enslaving themselves again to their thoughts about what other people have and desiring it. And then the last one on the list, it says, or anything else that belongs 
to your neighbor. Now, just a little Hebrew lesson. The word translated in English, anything, means anything, right? No way to get out of it. Sorry. So, so uh, surprise, surprise, the list that God gives us is a super good list. Here's some examples. House, wife, ox, donkey, or anything else. So anything you want to put on the list, anything you would see from anyone around you that you would say, gotta have it, takes up your mind, residence in your mind, you work and orchestrate to try to get it. Just don't do it. Don't do it. Don't covet your neighbor's anything. All right, next thing. Internal sins are precursors to external sins. Just like the internal sin of coveting, God says, don't, don't do it. It's going to lead to external sins. Look at the sin of stealing. I look around and I say, I really want it. I really got to have it. I really want it. I desire it. And so I begin to sort of nurture this discontent in my heart and in my mind. And eventually it may end up in me doing something about it that is a sin in and of itself. So I want you to imagine you're a young uh, man or young gal and you're at your friend's house and you're playing with their Nerf football. Now, who doesn't love a Nerf football, right? And at home, you know, you have a Nerf football, but your Nerf football has some problems. The neighborhood dog had come over and bit a chunk out of your Nerf football. So now it's kind of gross, and it's been outside a bunch, so now it's kind of gotten hard. It's not, like, really good and catchable anymore. So you, uh, you look at your friend's Nerf football, and you think, I really like this ball. It's the colors of my favorite team. It's... It's soft when I grab it. I can throw it really well. You can't really throw a spiral with a chunk out of the ball, so like mine at home. So what am I going to do? I'm thinking about it. I'm stewing about it. It's occupying my mental energy. It's, it's wrapping me up emotionally. Well, what am I going to do? I'm going to throw it in my bag and take it home. Now I've moved from internal to external. What was growing underneath the soil, like the corn seed, has now emerged in a sin, a sin that is observable. But folks, the point of today is the sin started back down inside, underground, unseen, the internal. person looks around at the nice things that others have, and they think to themselves, I should have them, I deserve them, and then they're able to grab money from their company and provide them for themselves by stealing. Don't covet your neighbor's wife. This, of course, leads to countless cases of adultery. What is covered up in sin, the sin that is covered under the soil like the, like the uh, corn seed is, will eventually come to the surface. Think of Jesus's words. Uh, we read them as though Jesus is making a more stringent, more robust approach to what sin is and what we should count as sin. And he is, but it really marries well with what he's already, God has already told us in the Ten Commandments. You have heard that it was said to people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders shall be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court, and anyone who says, you fool, will be in the dangers of the fire of hell. The external sin of murder, God says, deal with it when it's anger under the surface. Deal with it when it's an internal issue. It says the same thing about lust and adultery. Right? You have heard that it was said to people long ago. You shall not commit adultery. But I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully in her heart has already committed adultery with her. Right? The internal is the issue. The internal sin is what we should be working on. We need to battle what goes on in our minds and in our hearts. What we think about, what we spend our time thinking about matters greatly. Because eventually what we think about will be what we do. All right, dealing with internal sin. What can we do to deal with it? Well, the first thing that we can do is that we can immerse ourselves in the Word of God. We can immerse ourselves in the Word of God. The Word of God tells us what is true, what is right, what is noble, what is pure, what is honorable. All those things that Philippians 4.8 tells us that we should think on. Think on these things. God's Word tells us that material goods are useful and helpful and a blessing to us, but they are not to be the focus of our lives. We are told that other people matter, not other people's stuff. And so in Philippians 4, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. We have to guard our hearts and our minds. We have to protect them. We have to be careful of what we allow to come in and then make sure that we spend time 
thinking on things that are the good and the honorable. If you looked at your life, you said, well, what do I really value in life? I would challenge you to look at your calendar, not what you proposed to do or planned to do, but what you actually did. And then I would ask you to look at your checkbook or the registry on your uh, checking system online or your credit card statement or however you track your money and not think about what you plan to spend your money on, but what you actually spent your money on. Those would give you an idea of what you truly value. And the same would, go t- uh, would be true with what we do with the time and energy that we spend thinking. What are we spending our time thinking about? Are we spending our time coveting? Are we spending our time with thoughts of dissatisfaction with any aspect of our life that is not generating, hey, I'm not happy with this, I'm going to make some changes and move forward, that's a different deal. I'm talking about, I'm not happy with this because they have it and I don't have it, and it's not fair, and it's not right, and I deserve it, and they don't, and all that stuff. Uh, You want to know if you're doing a good job here? When someone gets an award or when someone buys something new and they're a friend of yours or somebody you know, what is your initial response to that? Do you think, hey, that's cool. Wow, congratulations. You're going to really enjoy that. That will be super cool for you to have. And wow, that's nice. I'm glad to hear it. And wow, it's really great to get recognition. I'm really, really happy for you. Or do you think, I deserve it? How come no one's recognized me? How come I got to still drive this thing? They're driving that thing. I got to drive this thing. How come their house is that? And I got I to live in this place. Right? That's What's going on? We've got to audit what's going on in our minds and in our hearts to know, are we spending our days coveting? God calls us to be a thankful people. We're moving closer to Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving's going to be weird this year, as many things are weird this year. Uh, Families are considering uh, checking temperatures of people before they come over or not having gatherings at all or wearing masks because families are coming in from different parts of the country or different parts of the state or people are not around all the time. And all this could be very different, but we still have much to be thankful for. Every day we have the breath of life, we can be thankful that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and paved the way for us to have a relationship with God so that we were no longer his enemies, but become not just his friend, but we are joined into his family. And if nothing else, we would have that. But we can also be thankful for all the material blessings we have. We can be thankful for the blessings of people that are are the people who You know, call us when the chips are down, the people who show up when things are not going well, the people who encourage us or come alongside of us or just join with us in doing things that are enjoyable, those people that are a blessing. We can be thankful. If you want to reverse the coveting part of your heart, if you want to reverse the dissatisfaction in your heart that leads to coveting, then turn to thanksgiving. Like all internal sins, anger, lust, coveting, We need to wage the war in our hearts and our minds. Not wait till we get to what we think is like behavior modification. Oh, I got to stop doing that or stop doing this or I shouldn't have done that or I shouldn't do this. No, let's start in our hearts where the thoughts of doing it are really the seed that is growing. What are you nurturing in your soil? Because whatever you're nurturing, scriptures say, God will not be mocked. You will reap, that is, you will harvest what you sow or what you plant. Father, help us to plant what is good, to cultivate and to nurture and to grow in our minds, in our hearts, with thankfulness as opposed to dissatisfaction, blessing as opposed to curse. Help us, Father, to live for you every day, not just externally, not just with what we do, not just with the things people can see, but with the interior of our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Yes.
I lift my 